everyone, and welcome to another Halloween horror movie review. This time around, we're going to be delving into sci-fi horror territory. Now, this uh, this movie, I guess, was one of the first sort of sci-fi horror movies I ever saw. Um, I have vague recollections of just seeing a few scenes from it when I was a kid, and it scared the crap out of me. So. I've seen it a few times since over the years, and uh, I was kind of curious as to, I haven't seen it for quite a while. I was kind of curious as to how it would hold up, um, and well, while it is a bit dated in some respects, it's still pretty damn scary. I'm of course talking about the adventures of Spartacus and Farrah Fawcett in Saturn Three. I don't know why I'm talking like this, but this is what we're going to talk about today on the Multimedia Chronicles. <laughs> Also, we have a very young, strapping young Mr. Wolf in this as well. And by Mr. Wolf, I of course mean Harvey Keitel. So yes, um, Kirk Douglas, Farrah Fawcett, and Harvey Keitel in space. How often do you see that? Well, look no further than Saturn 3. Yeah, basically uh, the story of Saturn 3 takes place in the far-flung future. Earth is in a bit of a crisis. Uh, we're essentially running out of food. People are having difficulty feeding themselves. I gather there's some kind of, you know, probably an environmental thing preventing the growth of food um, on Earth in sufficient quantities to feed the populace. So, um, Kirk Douglas and Farrah Fawcett play a, a couple uh, who are out on a space station called Saturn 3. It's, as you would guess, in orbit around Saturn. Um, and what they're up there to do is to research new ways to grow food more uh, efficiently. So they're trying to you know, do various experiments with hydroponics and things like that. So, Harvey Keitel's character shows up, um, supposedly there to help. And to further assist, he has brought with him a robot, part of what they call the Demigod series. Um, basically a robot kit that uh, has some organic material as a part of it, basically an organic uh, uh, brain matter, which has not had any information imprinted on yet, so it's clean, pure, untampered with brain matter. And um, Harvey Keitel's character is able to interface through a, you know, a jack in the back of his neck and directly link with this brain matter and give it information and such to be able to think and, and react and, and deal with situations somewhat intelligently. So it's a great idea. Essentially we have this powerful robot who's able to perform tasks that may be too difficult for humans or too dangerous for humans and is also able to think and reason and feel to some extent and, you know, help out. Seems like a great idea. Except, Harvey Keitel isn't the guy who was supposed to be bringing the robot and interfacing with it. Yeah, he's, uh, he's kind of a loony. And in the opening scene of the film, he actually kills the guy who was supposed to go up. And we find out also in that scene that he was denied for the mission, uh, Harvey Keitel's character that is, because he failed the psychological exam. He's a little nuts. And, uh, yeah, so needless to say, there's some interesting dynamics at play. And, as it turns out, and he makes no secret of the fact, he also has the hots for Farrah Fawcett, because Farrah Fawcett. <laughs> I think any um, male with a pulse would have the hots for Farrah Fawcett in, you know, 1981. Was this 1981? I think it was 1981. 
1980, 1980, sorry. So this was one year after Alien. So in Alien, of course, we had a alien killing machine out to kill everybody. In Saturn 3, we had a, uh, a well, essentially a very large robot, a, a tall, you know, he's about nine feet, eight or nine feet tall. He's big, big guy, big, powerful guy. Uh, goes by the name of Hector. So anyway, long and the short of it is, um, the robot then develops a bit of thing for Farrah Fawcett and uh, proceeds to attempt to get it, get her for himself and kill anyone who stands in his way. So it basically becomes a battle for survival between uh, everybody, <laughs> all three of the human characters versus the robot on the rampage trying to kill everybody. And essentially that's it. And you know going in, as soon as they start building this robot, that something's going to go wrong. Like, come on, it's just, you know this is going to be a killer robot movie. And as far as killer robot movies go, um, I've always had a soft spot for Saturn 3. It definitely has a cheese factor, and I think that cheese factor was apparent even at the time when it came out. It is a bit uh, tongue-in-cheek. This is not the typical kind of movie you see those three particular lead actors in. And, you know, they, not, none of them did a lot of science fiction. And uh, so it's kind of fun to see them, in a way, cast against type. I mean, Farrah Fawcett and Kirk Douglas. I mean, Kirk Douglas was getting up in years at this time. He was like 60-something. Uh, definitely showing showing his age. I mean, he's pretty, pretty fit for 62 or however old he was in this. But, you know, still. Um, old guy with, with hot, young, up-and-coming Farrah, Farrah Fawcett. You know, I mean definitely an unlikely pairing but somehow it works I mean they do have some nice chemistry together and uh, and I like the uh, and, and Farrah Fawcett's character has sort of an innocence about her that's that's kind of uh, kind of fun it's like uh, Kirk Douglas is the wise and old guy you can see you can tell he's been around the block a bit and, uh, and Farrah Fawcett was basically there to be his partner and, and assistant and they essentially fell in love and just you know um, have a thing going and then Harvey Keitel comes along and uh, his, his attitudes towards sexuality and monogamy are a little more progressive shall we say and he believes that uh, you know he's not he, he just wants to have sex with her basically and use her body for pleasure as he very clinically puts it um, now something interesting on the production side uh, as I was watching it I was I was kind of curious to hear Harvey Keitel's young man voice because of course we've all seen him in later years, in Quentin Tarantino films and the like, and this one is buzzing around here, some bug. Anyway, um, I often leave the patio door open, which, of course, with all the bright lights, just attracts bugs like crazy in the middle of the night. Oh well, um, whatever. Just a few houseflies between friends. Who cares? Um, so yeah, I was kind of curious here. You know, young, young Harvey Keitel's voice. Cause I couldn't remember. I couldn't remember what it what it was like. I hadn't seen the movie quite some time, and. When his character spoke, I was like, hmm, wow, his voice sounded a lot different when he was younger. And I I didn't think anything of it. And then as I, as I was watching, go away. As I was watching the extras, I learned that uh, for whatever reason, the director didn't, didn't feel that Harvey Keitel's voice was appropriate for the type of voice he wanted the character to have. He liked the acting, liked the performance. But just didn't feel that his voice was quite right. He wanted something a little more, uh, not so much British, but a little bit more uh, clinical, I guess, a little more proper, uh, rather than Harvey Keitel's somewhat, you know, Brooklyn accent. Uh, he just didn't feel it was appropriate for the character. Uh, so he hired uh, Roy Dotrice. Oh my God! Get out of my face! <laughs> Sorry. Just, I have all the brightest lights pointing at me. So, of course, all the bugs are coming to me. <sighs> I think it's just one, like a moth or... I don't know. Anyway. Uh, so they hired Roy Detrice, who's a longtime actor. You might recognize him from Beauty and the Beast. He played uh, Father in Beauty and the Beast. And he was also... Um, Game of Thrones fans may know him as the voice of the audiobooks of Game of Thrones. Yeah, he's actually done all the... Uh, I believe he's done all five books, actually. Uh, unabridged audiobooks of the Game of Thrones, uh, you know, Song of Ice and Fire series. He has a great voice, great voice. He's a very accomplished uh, actor, 
and also a very accomplished voice actor. So essentially he was hired to dub over all of Harvey Keitel's lines. Apparently Harvey Keitel was not too thrilled about that when he found out about it. But um, yeah, so if you're watching the movie and, and you, you find his character's voice a little odd to hear Roy Dotrice's voice coming out of Harvey Keitel's mouth, well, now you know why. It was basically a creative choice by the director. Even Roy Dotrice has no idea why he was, he was chosen. So anyway, I really enjoyed this a lot. I mean, the design on, uh, on Hector, the, the main, you know, the big robot, is actually quite cool and quite unique. Um, I mean, he's a bipedal robot, but he looks very mechanical. And apparently it was a guy in a suit, but you, I mean, you buy it as, as a giant robot who's stalking around and, uh, and, and trying to kill them and stuff. And uh, he's just very well done and it's a very uh, unique design. So it's, it's kind of a design that's, that's humanoid, but inhuman at the same time. So there's something, you know, sort of undefinably unnerving about him. And, uh, and he, he doesn't really have a head, he just kind of has these two uh, lights on like a, a maneuverable stock that he uses to, to look around and, it's, and it, it moves around quite a bit and, and there's often extreme close-ups of the eyes like looking right at you into your soul <laughs> and, uh, um, and there's some great uh, audio work actually for the sound effects as well. Plus, you know, being 1980, land of practical effects, some terrific uh, outer space stuff. In particular, um, I was really impressed with the uh, the shots of the uh, you know the sort of one man spacecraft that Harvey Keitel is using to approach Saturn three, and he's actually going through the rings of Saturn, and you see like the ice chunks flying by and stuff. It's quite well done, um, and apparently this was a fairly low budget film for the time, and uh, they did most of this stuff on the cheap. And you can't tell. I mean, it looks really, really good. Uh, the sets on the space station uh, at the beginning of the film, where you know they they uh, sort of getting everybody set, sent off on their missions, um, it's a very minimalist set, but it, it works. You just don't really think anything of it. It just it works. A lot of it is in darkness. There's a lot of mist and smoke and stuff uh, on the launch pad and. Um, it's all very minimalist, but you don't really think anything of it because it just keeps moving along at a good pace and and you just, you know, everything is just very functional and it's like, like this is all that we really need because this is the focus of this is the spaceship that Harvey Keitel gets into and stuff like that. And it's just, uh, I don't know, it just, it works. It works really well. Now, in terms of, uh, this is of course a Scream Factory release, it's very nice. There was no slipcover with this one. Some of them don't have slipcovers. This is not part of their uh, collector's edition line, even though it basically has the same amount of content as most of the collector's editions. So no new artwork for the cover. This is basically just the old movie poster, um, which is fine. I mean, it, it works quite well. It says, something is watching, waiting, and wanting on Saturn 3. So in terms of extras here, uh, it's apparently a brand new high definition transfer. It looked really good to me. I, I had no complaints. Blacks looked deep and inky and uh, you know, it just looked, it looked really good. Uh, definitely the best I've ever, I don't think I've ever seen it in widescreen before, so it's really nice to see it in widescreen. Uh, it's a 1.85 to 1 aspect ratio. Uh, so we got running commentary by uh, Greg Moss, who is, uh, uh, has been running a Saturn 3 fan page on the internet for quite some time. Uh, it's apparently quite, uh, you know, just loaded with info about the movie. Um, and also with film critic David Bradley. Uh, we've got an interview with uh, screenwriter, special effects artist Colin, Ch uh, screenwriter and special effects artist Colin Chilvers and actor Roy Dutrice. And uh, there's actually some deleted scenes here from the, there was, uh, as often happened with movies, there was, uh, there would be additional scenes filmed for the network television showings. And this is one of those that had some additional scenes filmed. Sadly, those scenes don't seem to exist in very nice quality. It's obviously taken from a VHS strip of some kind. But, um, you know, it's just nice to be able to see those scenes. So there's a couple of, you know, fairly significant extensions. It's about 10 minutes worth of deleted scenes. Um, some of which are just extensions of existing scenes, some of which are entirely new scenes entirely. Um, and there's also uh, the, the, the so-called uh, deleted ecstasy scene, where the, uh, uh, you know, Kirk Douglas and Farrah Fawcett take like a sort of ecstasy, like futuristic ecstasy type pill 
and uh, and have a nice little you know romantic moment together. Apparently that it, we, in the in the in the movie we see them uh, divide up the pill so they both take a half and then a bit of their conversation. But there's a whole scene that follows that that was actually cut out of the final film. That scene has been restored uh, here. It's not in the film, but it's in the uh, deleted scenes. Um, it seems like they lost the audio track for part of the scene, so you'll hear the dialogue and such for most of it, but uh, not for the last last couple shots there. Um, and then, of course, we have the original theatrical trailer. We actually have a couple of theatrical trailers on there. There's, um, I think there was a radio one as well. And, uh, oh no, there wasn't a radio one. I think there was, uh, am I thinking of another? So I've watched a few Scream Factory releases uh, recently, so <laughs> I might be mixing my extras together in my brain. Anyway, at least you very do, you, you very do like get the theatrical trailer, the okay. So uh, Saturn Three, would I recommend it? Absolutely. If you're a sci-fi horror fan and you don't mind uh, uh, a little bit of cheese with your sci-fi horror, this is definitely not of the same caliber as something like Alien. Um, this is kind of bordering on. I mean, it's it's obviously got some some, uh, you know, some uh, cast caliber and production value caliber uh, and such, but it, it does kind of have that feeling of a low-budget horror film. Um, and I think at the time, they, they talk about this in the extras, at the time, uh, science fiction wasn't really given a big budget. It was kind of seen as a low-budget genre, so they weren't given a ton of money to do this film. Um, and uh, the special effects uh, fellow even mentions, he says, uh, even, uh, holy crap, this is, uh, my mister is just spewing water all over the place. All right, I'm going to clean that up in just a moment here. <laughs> uh, it says that even the original Star Wars, which is only, you know, three years old at the time, was done for a relatively low budget at the time, uh, considering what a complicated film it was. And uh, the same goes for Saturn III. It was actually produced fairly on the cheap. But honestly, they got a lot of mileage out of that budget because it's actually a pretty decent looking film. Um, I really liked a lot of the set design. I definitely like the design on Hector. It's quite a quite a unique robot design that we haven't really seen before. Um, and the, you know, the three leads are three of the finest actors who were around uh, in Hollywood at the time. So great stuff. So Saturn 3, check it out. Available now from Scream Factory. Amazon link in the description. As always, I try to make it easy for you. Alrighty, that is it for me to you for now. So until next time, thanks for watching, and sayonara.